Hi, hello again. Hello. Hi. So I uh, want to continue with the discussion of Gauss's method. And uh, this time I want to talk about, in some sense, what can, what can go wrong. What, what things could happen when you're doing Gauss's method that tells you that there's something uh, else, uh, something other than just a unique solution. So last time we saw the, the theorem that justifies Gauss's method. It says that if you perform any of those three operations, then the set of solutions before you perform the operation and the set of solutions after you perform the operation is the same set of solutions. So you don't change the solutions to the set of linear equations by performing those three operations. And so uh, if you systematically apply them in the way that we saw last time, you will end up with a system that, that you know you hope tells you that here's the answer. Now sometimes you end up with a system that tells you something else about the system and uh, we you know about the starting system and we uh, we want to talk about that today. Okay uh, so let me um, let me let me pop that down for a second and get myself some paper to write on here. Okay. Okay, so uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is uh, how do you um, how do you make up a system of your own? So there's uh, there's sometimes a person can learn a lesson from trying to um, uh, uh, trying to make up problems like homework problems of their own. So the the natural thing to do is to um, to decide. Oh, I'm going to take say I, I want a system where the solution is x equals four and y equals one. And so I'm just going to make up a couple of linear equations where x equals 4 and y equals 1. This is two unknown, so I, I just, ju just to do something, I'm going to have two equations. How about uh, x minus 3y equals 1? And uh, again, just, 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 just to make something, I don't really have anything in mind, especially uh, 2x plus 2y equals, let's see, that's 8 and 2 is 10. So that's a linear system. Uh, I know in advance that it's going to have this solution, and uh, uh, that would be perfectly amenable to Gauss's method. In fact, why don't I give Gauss's method a whack here? So I'm going to transform that system. I'm going to use the x to get rid of the 2x, so that's minus 2 rho 1 add to rho 2. The x minus 3y doesn't change at all. And the 2x plus 2y, let's see, so minus 2 times an add makes 0. Minus 2 times an add, so minus 2 times minus 3 makes positive 6. And add to 2 makes positive 8. Minus 2 times, times positive 1 makes minus 2. And, and, and you're looking at 8. Uh, not a very good 8. And so, of course, from this, this is in the echelon form that we talked about last time. From this, a person immediately concludes, so y equals 8, excuse me, y equals 1. And then with y equals 1, x minus times 1, x minus 3 times 1 equals 1. So x minus 2 minus 3 equals 1, and so x equals 4. Okay. So, so this gives you a person some insight into how, how you construct these systems. Basically, if you want to have a unique solution, you start off by constructing some equations that have that for a solution. It also gives us some insight into how you might construct a bigger system. So let me, uh, let me start off. I have one, have one chosen in advance here. I'm going to take x plus y plus z equals 6. x plus y plus z equals 6. And then uh, x plus 2y plus z equals 8. x plus 2y plus z equals 8. And now let me think about the third equation. So a, a person can say, uh, well, I'll just make some stuff up. And uh, probably if you just make some stuff up, you, you'll probably find some solution. But I, I want to think about a particular way of making these systems. That is to say, suppose I take here 2x and 3y, see what I'm doing, of course, adding down, and 2z, and let's think about what happens over here. So that's to say, what if there is some relationship among these equations? I'll say it again, because it's the most important thing in the first month of the class. What if there is some relationship among these equations? 
over here on the left hand side, row 1 plus row 2 adds to row 3. What could I do on the right hand side? Well, I could make row 1 plus row 2 add to row 3. I could write a 14 there. Or I could make row 1 plus row 2 not add to row 3. I could write a 13 there. And that's basically what we're going to talk about today. What happens when there's a relationship and, and the relationship, in this case, gets violated? So let me pop up the slide. There we go. Oh, there's me again. So we want to talk today about what happens with Gauss's method. Oops, clicked on the wrong thing. What happens with Gauss's method when it's not the case that um, uh, uh, when it when it's not the case that there's a unique solution, the x equals four, y equals one case. When it's, that's not true, when instead you come to a system that does not have a unique solution. So here we're looking at the, the system that I drew on the paper just a second ago, x plus y plus e equals 6, x plus 2, y plus e equals 8. And again, the left-hand side, x and x makes 2x, y and 2y makes 3y, z and z makes 2z. But 6 and 8 doesn't make 13. So it, it can't be the case that if you're going to have an x, a y, and a z that add to 6, and it's also going to be the case that your x and your 2y and your z are going to add to 8, then it cannot be the case that your 2x and your 3y and your 2z adds to 13. That just can't happen. So it has to, be, it has to hold here that this system has no solution. There can't be any x, y, z that make the, all three of those equations true at the same time. It just can't happen. So the question is, I, I advertised last time that Gauss's method was perfect. Okay, so how does Gauss's method tell me that? You know, it's not a computer program, so it's not going to have a line that says print, you, you know, you idiot, you, you, you asked a nonsensical question. So it's got to tell me somehow that there's no solution. Well, how could it possibly tell me that? Okay, so as, so often in linear algebra, you just just do it. Just it just do the do the reduction here. Minus row one plus row two minus two row one plus row three, and you 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 get uh, you know you get what you get. The arithmetic is not very interesting. A person already spots y equals two and y equals one and says, hmm. But I'll pretend that I didn't notice that because, of course, if the, if the system of equation had hundreds of equations and this was some conflict between equation 71 and equation 243, I, I wouldn't have noticed it. What happens if you go on to get to echelon form? And there you go. Echelon form tells you very explicitly you asked a question all the way at the start that doesn't have an answer. This system doesn't have an answer. And the theorem that I just showed 30 seconds ago, whoops, 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 went too far. Theorem that I just showed says the set of solutions is unchanged. So since the set of solutions was unchanged and this doesn't have any solutions, then backing up, this must not have any solutions. This is how Gauss's method tells you. Gauss's method perfect in this sense. Gauss's method tells you there is no solution. It doesn't give you a bogus solution. It tells you there is no solution because when you get to echelon form, at least one of the rows has some impossibility. 0 equals minus 1, 0 equals 12, 0 equals 192, some kind of impossibility. So you will spot when you're doing a Gauss's method problem, if you ever run across an equation that says like 0 equals minus 1, what that tells you from the previous theorem is that it must be the case that the set of solutions to the original system is empty no solutions. You asked, a, you asked a question that can't be answered because, well, it can be answered by saying there's no solution because uh, no way for an x, a y, and a z to satisfy all three of these. Okay, now there's one other thing that can happen here that's maybe a little more subtle than this case, but one other thing that can happen here, you remember I did it on the piece of paper, I said x plus y plus e equals 6, x plus 2y plus e equals 8, and then I said 2x plus 3y plus 2z, and I, I put a question mark there, and I asked myself, what if I put a 13? That was one of the two questions that I asked. But I also asked myself, what if I put a 14? Now you see, if if you put a 14 there, then you're then then you're you're putting in basically the same information twice. What happens when you have redundant information? What happens when you have a, a, in in that case a third row that contains the same information as the previous two or aggregates the information from the previous two? And so here we have a problem that does basically the same thing. Three equations, three unknowns, just to glance at it, at least in, in my mind anyway, just to glance at it. You don't spot right away that there's something funny about it. 
you apply Gauss's method, row 1 add to row 2 to get rid of the x, 3 row 1 plus row 3 to get rid of the 3x. Next up is to use that minus y to get rid of the minus 4y, and you end up with echelon form, and you're like, okay, well, no, it doesn't say 0 equals 5 or 0 equals 21, so it, it doesn't have some impossibility, but it also doesn't have an equation for z. It's got an equation where y leads, it's got an equation where x leads, but it doesn't have an equation where z leads. So there's no way to get started on that back substitution process. More precisely here, in this two equation, three unknown system, if you tell me a z, I can solve for x and y. So for instance, if you tell me z equals zero, I can tell you that y equals minus six and then I can go on to solve for x. If you tell me that z equals 1, I can tell you that it's like that. If you told me that z equals 142, I could then solve for y, and using the y and the 142, I could then solve for x. That is to say, there are infinitely many solutions. There is a family of solutions, and every z gives you a different solution. So there's a family of solutions, I'll say parameterized by z. Those solutions are different. Z equals 0 gives one solution. Z equals 1 gives another solution. Now, in the previous case here, we got 0 equals minus 1. And how could a person miss that? You know, you right away, you'd spot that there was something wrong. And you just, you just circle it and write something like no solutions and move on to the next problem. Here, there's something a little subtle about the, z, about the 0 equals 0. 0 equals 0 does not tell you that there are infinitely many solutions. That's not right. Back here, 0 equals minus 1 told you, without any need to go any further, that there are no solutions. But here, 0 equals 0 does not tell you there are infinitely many solutions. 0 equals 0 tells you that one of the equations was redundant on the others. What tells you that there are infinitely many solutions is that you've got echelon form and there's no equation for one of the letters. There's no equation here where z leads. There's an equation where x leads. There's an equation where y leads. There's no equation where z leads. That's what marks infinitely many solutions. So let's look at another example that I hope drives that point home a little, a little better. So don't say to yourself, look for 0 equals 0. No, 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 no. Say to yourself, look for a row for every letter. All right, so here, I, I have the x plus y plus z equals 4, x plus 2 x minus y plus z equals 4, x plus y minus 2z equals minus 1, and I do the Gauss's method step, there's only one, a and I've got echelon form because as much as I can, the variables fall off to the right. But again, I do not have a, I do not have a row for z. I just don't have it. There's only two rows. I have three letters and only two rows. I just don't have a row for z. But if you told me, for example, that z equals 0, then I could solve for x and y. If you told me that z equals minus 1, then I could solve for x and y. If you told me that z equals 5, then I could solve for x and y. There are infinitely many solutions, a different one for every z. There's no 0 equals 0. It's, uh, 0 equals 0 is not your clue about infinitely many solutions. What your clue about infinitely many solutions, the thing to look for, is when you get to echelon form, does some row, it, it, is there some letter for which there is no row that it leads? Here, 0 equals 0 only means that z's chance to lead a row is just, is just not there. OK, so, so for no solutions, that's an easy one. A person spots that there's some impossibility. If at some point in the process you spot an impossibility, you don't need to go on with the process. You can just stop. However, if you get to the end and you say to yourself, there's not a unique solution here, there's not a unique solution here, well, then you're looking at infinitely many solutions. And you can use the letter that doesn't lead. You can use a variety of things, but we're going to use the letter that doesn't lead. You can use the letter that doesn't lead. In this case, z doesn't lead. You can use the letter that doesn't lead to give you the infinitely many solutions. OK, we're going to do that next time. The, the, the talk next time is called Describing the Solution Set. And so we're going to talk about how you write down the infinitely many solutions. OK, very good. Bye bye.